Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. Food prices are soaring around the world, and along with it, so are rates of food insecurity and the risk of famine. As my guest today, Sir Mark Lowcock, explains, this is partly due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which exacerbated an already worsening situation. Mark Lowcock is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development and author of the new book, Relief Chief, a Manifesto for Saving Lives in Dire Times. He served as the top United Nations humanitarian official from 2017 to 2021, and prior to that had a long career in the British government, including as the top civil servant in the Department for International Development. We kick off discussing what we know about the worst global food crisis in several decades before having a broader conversation about its causes, consequences, and specific actions that can be taken to prevent this crisis from getting worse. Mark Lowcock is one of the world's leading experts on global humanitarian crisis and response. And I was very glad to speak with him about this timely issue. As always, if you have questions or comments for me, you can hit me up on Twitter at Mark L. Goldberg or use the contact button on globaldispatches.org. All right, now here is my conversation with Sir Mark Lowcock, former UN Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, and now Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Global Development. What we have now is the world's worst food crisis for many decades. The United Nations, in in the form of the leading agencies like the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Programme and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, have just, in the last day or so, put out a new report, their annual report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world. And what that says is that there's been an increase by 150 million people in the number of people around the planet who are going hungry, basically, who face some kind of chronic undernourishment or malnutrition or worse than that. Um, So it's gone up from something less than 700 million to something closer to um, 830 million. To what extent is the Russian blockade of Ukrainian exports of key agricultural goods, grains and and maize and and other goods responsible for that increase? Well, what Putin's invasion of Ukraine has done is make dealing with that big increase in chronic food insecurity much harder. The causes predate, by and large, the invasion. So um, at the beginning of this year, we were already dealing with a very severe problem in multiple countries around the world, low income countries mostly. And that problem has its origins in the spread of conflict around the world in recent years, in the increasingly visible and damaging and dangerous effects of climate change, both droughts and more aggressive storms and floods, and also in the impact, the economic impact of the COVID pandemic, um, which has been much worse in very poor countries than in rich countries. And in fact, the economic impact of the pandemic is probably much more damaging to human um, health and livelihoods than the virus has been itself. What the invasion of Ukraine has done is firstly send food prices through the roof. Um, They were already at high levels, higher probably than we've seen since 2007, also sent fertilizer prices through the roof and energy prices through the roof. And that combination of food, fuel and fertilizer um, deals with both the immediate problem of hunger, but also the challenge of um, reducing hunger in years ahead, because it makes producing more food more expensive and more difficult and transporting it to the places that need it more difficult. 
The other effect um, that Putin's invasion has had is to take off the market 21 million tons of grain stuck in Ukraine's silos. That's enough grain to meet the needs of 400 million people. So um, the fact that that grain's not there anymore is a another kind of reinforcing problem um, which goes beyond the price hike that we've seen. So you describe in a blog post on the Center for Global Development's website uh, a suite of countries that you have identified that are both uh, highly dependent on food imports and also already prone to high levels of food insecurity. Could you maybe describe that relationship and also discuss, describe what it's like in some of those countries right now? If, if a human being wants food to eat, um, that person has two options. Firstly, they can grow the food for their themselves and their family. And in many poor countries, large proportions of the population are based on subsistence agriculture, food that they grow on their own lands. The second option, of course, which is the one that is now available to the vast majority of human beings on the planet and didn't in the deep history of used to be available to so many, is to buy food. Now, um, there are lots of countries in the world which don't um, produce enough food to feed their populations. The United Kingdom, where I'm talking to you from, is one of them. But there are many countries in the developing world who have a chronic need to import food. So they are very affected by um, the markets and their ability to import food is also obviously very affected by their financial situation, the state of their economy and availability of foreign exchange and so on. And those countries come into two broad groups, really. The, the first is a group of countries which are essentially credit worthy and could borrow from the international financial institutions and um, to some degree on the markets to import the food that they need. And the, the, the problem those countries are facing is the problem arising from um, the hike in the food prices and the closure of, of key markets. The other group of countries, though, it, are those where um, typically famines occur, where there are um, governments have very limited resources. Um, too many families this year and in many years are unable to grow enough food to feed themselves. And those um, countries are often ones that are not so credit worthy, so can't borrow on the markets and which are also heavily reliant on uh, the humanitarian agencies. And in that last group of countries, I'm thinking about places like Somalia, Ethiopia, especially northern Ethiopia, Afghanistan, large parts of the Sahel, Yemen, and so on. But there is a bigger group of countries who've got this fiscal problem, and they include places like, well, include Turkey, um, include um, Egypt, Lebanon, a wide variety of slightly better off African countries than places like uh, Somalia. I wanted to dive a little deeper into those two baskets of countries. In the countries that are most vulnerable, that are not credit worthy, that are more reliant on international aid and humanitarian relief, are you seeing as a consequence of the Ukraine crisis that aid is in fact being diverted from major donors, typically those that you would expect to contribute to uh, relief in places like Somalia uh, is yes. going to Ukraine instead that, you know, we're not increasing the entire pie, rather what aid budgets are available are being diverted to Ukraine. Yes, that is what we, we saw, especially in the first few months uh, after Putin's invasion. So the first thing that happened was prices went through the roof. So aid agencies could buy less with the money available to them. The second thing that happened was many countries um, reallocated the aid they were given to humanitarian agencies to deal with the Ukraine problem at the expense of um, some of those chronically um, undernourished and famine threatened countries that we talked about earlier. The country which has made the most egregious and damaging decisions, unfortunately, is the UK. The UK as part of the overall aid cuts since 2020, has um, savagely reduced its 
emergency assistance for countries affected by uh, or threatened by famine. The UK is historically a key donor in this area. So these, yeah, the this, this reallocation is particularly painful. Five, six years ago, just in Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, South Sudan, the UK's assistance has fallen from £850 million, which it was then, to less than £300 million, less than £200 million, in fact. So that's a huge reduction. Now, fortunately, no other donor has imposed cuts of that scale. And um, in the last couple of months, some donors have recognised the scale of the problem and have put additional money on the table to try to cope with it. Above all, the Biden administration, I really give them um, a lot of credit for the fact that the president proposed and the Congress approved an additional $5 billion to tackle this global food security uh, challenge. And if that money is spent fast enough in the right places, we may still avoid mass loss of life through extreme famines. Uh, there's at least a chance of doing that now um, because of what the administration has done. But we, we're not, I'm not sure whether we will avoid that, uh, whether the money will be quite enough or whether it will be deployed fast enough in the places it really has to go. Uh, so the other basket of countries you reference are those that uh, may be heavily indebted and may have a difficult time both servicing that debt and providing fiscal support for their population to buy wheat and, and other foodstuffs. What's the relationship between a country's level of indebtedness and its ability to handle modest or even sharp increases in global food prices? Well, unfortunately, it's a very um, substantial and acute one. Of course, th these countries with high levels of debt are typically also countries um, which are very poor. So, um, you know, they're ones that it's not just about being indebted. It's also about, um, you, you know, overall levels of resources. Uh, and many African countries are um, so indebted that, they are really struggling at the moment to access the resources at a decent price to be able to food import, afford food imports and then to be able to scale up their social safety net programs so that families uh, can access money to go to the market and buy the food that's being imported. Um, and the, the thing that really I think needs to happen to deal with that is uh, twofold. Firstly, in the short term, there needs to be additional financing uh, made available to those countries, particularly from the international financial institutions. And then secondly, there will need at some point to be uh, some kind of renewed treatment of uh, their debt, as happened um, during that period of heavy indebtedness about 20 years ago. This time it's going to be harder because the creditors are broader and more, uh, in a way, more complicated. There's lots of Chinese debt and there's lots of private sector debt. So Whereas 20 years ago, that problem could be solved largely by agreements between Western countries. That is not going to work this time. Yeah, 20 years ago, there was this whole movement around debt forgiveness inspired by the Jubilee, the, the year 2000. I think the Pope got on board, civil society groups got on board, and it was a fairly successful endeavor. But you're saying now, because debt is far more diffuse, uh, it's going to be harder to encourage creditors to forgive all these debts. Yeah. And that Jubilee campaign 20 years ago was really a cool thing because it wasn't just about forgiving the debt and rescheduling it. It was also about promises and guarantees that the resources freed up would be used to deal with poverty and um, promote the social good. A lot of the money was that was saved was specifically earmarked to things like getting every child into school, to improving basic health services and so on. So the deal was help with indebtedness in exchange for reforms which would be for the benefit of the wider population. And that is, again, something that needs to be part of a next phase of debt relief. But the crucial thing and the thing that's holding it back the next phase is the fact that the creditors are much more diverse and no one group of creditors will want uh, to offer generous help if the others are taking a free ride.
So if present trends continue, if inflation continues to increase, if food prices go up, if that grain stored at ports in Ukraine continued to be sort of locked in, to what extent might these trends contribute to political instability in certain regions? And are there specific countries that you're particularly concerned for? So my first concern is those countries threatened by mass loss of life through famines. You know, the whole of human history has been characterized by frequent events of uh, large populations starving to death in countries all over the world. And one of the remarkable things about the last 50 years is that that has essentially stopped happening. There's only been one famine in the world of a significant scale in the last 20 years when a quarter of a million Somalis lost their lives in 2011. And the world has got much better at preventing that happening and seeing off the risks when they appear. But the scale of the crisis we have now is that there is a clear and present danger of that kind of thing being repeated, for example, in Somalia, for example, in parts of Ethiopia, for example, if we're not careful, in Afghanistan and Yemen and parts of the Sahel. Um, now, that is um, one order of problem, and it, it, that's a kind of, as I said, a problem that I'm very, very personally focused on, partly because my first job was dealing in, the, in Ethiopia with the famine that took a million people's lives in the mid-1980s, and I hoped that we wouldn't see that kind of thing again. But it's also the case that if you have food security crises which don't threaten deaths on a massive scale, but do add to people's misery and malnutrition and grievances, there are political and stability consequences of that, especially in places which are already unstable, parts of the Middle East, parts of Africa, and so on. And one of the things that we know from unhappy experience over the last 10 and 20 years is instability is in fact Infectious. Problems created of that sort in one country spread very easily to neighboring regions. People flee when they think they can't survive at home. That has a ripple effect. The ripple spread very far and wide. A million Syrians walked to Europe in 2015 because they thought they wouldn't get enough help to survive in a decent way, either in Syria or in the countries surrounding Syria to which they had first fled. So there are serious and and dangerous consequences of instability in addition to the threat of mass loss of life. So we're in this acute crisis period right now for reasons you describe. I'm curious to learn from you what can be done to nudge us out of this crisis phase. I mean, one immediate obvious example is securing a deal to release that grain held in Ukrainian ports. I know your old boss, Antonio Guterres, is working or or at a time was working on a deal to perhaps release some Belarusian and Russian fertilizer in exchange for the lifting of that blockade in Ukraine. Would a deal like that have an immediate ameliorative effect? Well, I mean, strategically, I think there are four broad sorts of things that need to happen. The first is, yes, we need to get some of the available grain onto the grain markets, preferably from uh, Ukraine and with Russian acquiescence. Um, and that will not just make grain more available. It will also have a you know, marked effect, I think, on um, food prices. So it would, it would help in multiple ways. Another way to achieve the same thing would be for those countries which hold very large strategic grain reserves to be willing to release at least some of their grain onto the market. Which countries specifically have those reserves that could be released? Well, there's a number of them. They include the United States, China and India. Hmm. The second thing I think needs more attention and was touched on rather in a rather glancing way at the summit of the group of seven Western industrial countries leaders in Bavaria late June is what economists call the supply response. In other words, 
against the likelihood that um, it will be very hard to restore the levels of Russian and Ukrainian grain production and grain export to what they were last year and in previous years to those levels in the next year or two years or how, who knows how long. There needs to be compensatory um, planting and um, access to inputs, including fertilizer in a bunch of other places. That could include the European Union. So we're talking about that. That could include North America. It could include Canada, parts of South America and other places as well. That also, though, needs to um, provide some incentives and encouragement to more of the farmers in countries where um, the populations are most vulnerable to make it more attractive to plant more grain and also to find the other inputs. And there, there is a particular problem to do with fertilizer, which is that um, some countries producing fertilizer in those regions where people are particularly hungry are exporting almost all their fertilizer. There's a very large new fertilizer factory in Nigeria, most of whose production is being exported to developed countries. So there's some adjustment there that needs to be made as well. The third thing strategically that needs to happen is to provide access to um, more generous financing on a bigger scale to those countries which have got that huge fiscal um, and financing problem that you were asking me about earlier. And then the fourth thing, and this fourth thing is urgent and will is the only way actually in which people threatened right now um, by famine will be saved is for there to be enough emergency humanitarian aid, enough money, in other words, in the hands of organizations like the World Food Program, the Red Cross, um, international NGOs and so on, so that they can um, put a combination of food, physical commodities and purchasing power into the um, hands, if you like, of the people who without it will simply starve. You know, you've listed four steps that could be taken to uh, support a reduction of suffering from this crisis. Are there any particular indicators or inflection points in the coming days, weeks, or months that will suggest to you whether or not the international community is indeed taking those steps? Well, to start with the last one, there's very good real-time data on how much aid is going through the emergency response plans that are the work of the United Nations system and all the international NGOs, because they are coordinated. And the office I used to run, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, produces um, real-time, daily, daily updated information on for every country where there's a big crisis, on what resource level is available, what's being provided by the donors to deal with that problem. And likewise, there's a running commentary provided by food security experts in, in organizations like uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Program, and other places on where the food security problems are worst and where they're improving and where they're getting worse. So we will see quite a lot of what's happening. It will obviously be highly visible to everybody if it proves um, possible to extract some of those 20 million tons of grain from Ukraine's silos. That will be a powerful um, signal of lots of things. It, it will also be um, you know, quite visible whether the international financial institutions are um, instructed and enabled by their powerful shareholders to provide more financing for um, the countries with uh, who are constrained mostly by fiscal problems. So it will be, um, you know, it will be quite visible whether we're making progress on all this or not. And most visible of all, there will be footage of large numbers of starving children and babies in, from countries like Somalia, if enough of the right things in the right places at the right scale are not done. So we will see what's happening. Uh, well, Mark, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for covering it. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Mark Lowcock for coming back on the show. I had him last on the show when he was still serving in that top UN post, but 
It's nice to reconnect with him. And I just started his book. It's an interesting read on global humanitarian issues and an inside account of how UN response to those humanitarian crises work. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.